afternoon. Um, so one thing that wasn't said about myself in the, uh, in the introduction, uh, I am, I'm German. I might sound like a German. That is because I am a German. I might also sound like a control freak, and that is because I am a control freak. So there are no kitty cats or audience participation in that. You guys are going to take out your notepads, and you're going to just take some notes, right? Can, can, we, can, we, can we agree to that work standard? So um, I went to my primary care physician, actually, for my kind of uh, annual checkup recently. And I have good news to report. I grew by two inches since I saw him last, right? So I, I kind of, please look, look up to me. Um, I want to nevertheless start this with a, with a little quiz. And um, I, I kind of let me read a quote from you that was made by one of the US presidents, that the conservation of our national resources is only preliminary to the question of national efficiency. Who do you think said that? Sounds a little bit like Obama. National, you might kind of see some Republican in there. Any, any takers? So it uh, turns out that this is the opening line in The Principles of Scientific Management, a book which was written 100 years ago, talking about basically making things more productive. That's kind of what we in operations try to do. Some of you might have taken Open 101. or So we are about making things more efficient. And it's actually, I, I mean, I, I wrote a book. Uh, if, if you read one book on operations, I have to say read this one. It's really amazing. And if you think about, if you think about care and healthcare and people running around in Washington and throughout the country uh, talking about efficiency in healthcare, this is where they should start. All right, let me read you one line here that we can see, the feel, we can see and feel the waste of material things. Awkward, inefficient, or ill-directed movements of men, and I guess for today's standards we add women, however, leave nothing visible or tangible behind. So when people talk about, oh, we have a healthcare efficiency problem in the country, you have to tell me what this inefficiency looks like. Where is there actually waste in the system that you can comfortably look a doctor in the eye and say, this, my friend, was waste? And that's a real challenge. And it's a particularly challenging thing because if you think about healthcare management, if you think about managing a healthcare system, a big practice, you're talking to doctors and you really don't know what's going on in that care process, right? Should it take 20 minutes to care for a patient? 30 minutes, what the heck are these people doing anyway? And if you think about then standing kind of work standards of how many patients could be seen by Dr. X, that's often called the panel of the doctor, you're very, very kind of unscientific, you're very casual about coming up with these measurements. And in many ways, that's a problem that I try to tackle. I, don't, I want to move beyond this kind of this notion of kind of absence of data, absence of scientific principles. I want to really understand the time it takes you to care for a patient. And so the way that we've done this, this is a really hard problem. Because you know, when people are studying some worker putting in kind of little wires or chips in a circuit board, I can stand next to them and I can stand there with a stopwatch. That's a really tricky thing to do, right? I mean, next, thing, you know, next time you, you, know, you go to your primary care physician, I stand next to you and they kind of stopwatch this. And it's kind of awkward, right? And so what we have done is we have videotaped, we've installed 100, for, for 144 patient encounters in primary care. We've installed video cameras in the primary care facilities with the approval of the IRB, of the doctors, and of the patients. And we have basically video recorded what was happening in these rooms with the hope that if there is this inefficiency in the American healthcare system, that it, it shows up somewhere in this tape. Right? If we can't find it, then you know, what, what, where is it? The way that we kind of produce this, I'm very proud of that. I created this app called My Observer. It's a little kind of um, uh, app that lets you do literally time and motion studies. Try this out on your marketing professor next time that you come to class. And kind of press like go when they're sending a funny story. Then press on the next thing when they are kind of boring you. And then you can download it. You can share it with your friends. Can form a little community around it. it, it, it it's, <laughs> It, it would have it would made me a millionaire, except uh, I set the price at p equals zero, and so I'm I'm kind of waiting for the volume to compensate me for that low <laughs> for that low price. So what we did is we, we we basically have these video clips, 
And then we have basically, we have kind of, of these observers that sit there with, uh, with the, the iPod, iPhone, and they are like stop watching every little thing that happens in that encounter. Right? That's what we mean when we talk about doing a time and motion study in primary care. And out of this comes data that looks like this. Right? You basically get these episodes, if you wish, typically 20 to 30 minutes long, starting when the patient enters the room. There's a little discussion. Uh, then there's a little more discussion. You talk about the medications. Most of the time, primary care, by the way, looks like, like this. Right? Doctor on the computer doctor on the computer, right? It's kind of typing type of exercises. But we capture literally minute by minute what is happening through the primary care encounters. Now, what do we do with this? So we really, let me kind of present you from this line of work, let me present to you two pieces of analysis that I think is very interesting. One is just a very simple descriptive study of what the heck is going on in these 30 minute encounters. So for example, you look at, we have kind of come up with, uh, through an, the help of an expert panel, we've come up with this kind of category, a set of tasks that we use here, ranging from kind of small talk, talking about existing conditions, all the way to visit notes and examining the patients. It is remarkable in many ways, actually, uh, the, the, how, how little time in care nowadays is actually spent on anything that involves touching, diagnosing the patients. Right? Most of the things are paperwork, computer work, refilling medications and talking about things uh, like chronic conditions or social care, kind of social coordination type of challenges. And so um, that's the first observation that if you look at what's really happening in primary care, some of these things you, you really wonder, should they actually be happening? Should they be happening done by a doctor? Should they be happening done in a face-to-face -face encounter? Or are there other ways that we can think about delivering care? And that gets us then to the second uh, type of analysis that we do here. We have this wonderful data set about literally these kind of minute-by-minute -minute things that happen in primary care. And we want to then think about the question of are there new service delivery models for care? So as was said in the introduction, I, for example, just taught a course on Coursera. It has made me realize that the way that we teach is not written in stone. We can use technology and start redefining the way that we deliver that service called education. The same thing is happening in primary care or in care in general right now, where we start here where we've always been, doctor sees a patient for 30 minutes, and we call this a primary care encounter, and we, we start rethinking that, right? And so what, let, let me kind of articulate at least two dimensions on which we can start rethinking this. One dimension is, which is very kind of hot topic in this day, these days with the doctors, is they go like, I'm doing all of these tasks that really didn't require me going to med, med school, right? Is there a way that I can dump my work to somebody else? Right? And so this is called oftentimes a physician extender. Various levels of, of, of nursing level uh, uh, taking over more and more doctorally types of tasks. And so we can look at these things and wonder what percentage of these things could actually be done by somebody else that didn't go to med school. The second way to slice this data is we can also ask ourselves, well, what of this work really did have to happen, me and you being in the same room? as opposed to me picking up the phone, me sending you an email, or kind of doing any type of remote interaction, which, again, if you think about Coursera or other technology platforms, we are more and more comfortable uh, doing these days. So ask yourselves, kind of, if I, I'm starting here with 100% of the work, this is what's kind of where care is delivered right now, ask yourself, well, you know, how much of that do you think can be moved to an extender? How much of that can be moved offside? Just think about that. Uh, again, I, th I was surprised by that when we ran, so what we did to score this is we took these videotapes, put them into these chunks that I just explained a moment ago, and then we hired an expert panel. These are practicing primary care providers, and we had them basically watch these videos and then make decisions of their, to the level of that they felt comfortable that this could be offloaded to an extender or moved remotely to by somebody else. So it's not, this is not Christian watching a kind of a heart surgery and go like, you know, I think I could have done that one, right? And it's, <laughs> these, are, these are people who do this for a living and are practicing actually in the same healthcare system, which I should add is uh, Vision 4 here, the Philadelphia VA hospital system. 
So look at the data here. Look at the data here. It's interesting that the doctors are estimating that about 20% of their work could be done by somebody, by, by an extender, 21.72%. They felt comfortable, like, I wish I could have delegated that work. I'd argue that's a conservative estimate, right? These are the, these are the doctors judging this. They, they really want to take care of their patients. We have seen only committed and very empathetic doctors. So it's not that they, they hate their patients. They felt like 20% of the time, at least, somebody else could leverage my productivity. I was even more surprised by the other finding here that you, th you think about here the percentage of work that could be done offsite. They looked at these encounters and about 80% of the work, they were totally comfortable of doing this remotely without the patient in the room. 80% of what's going on in that hospital, if you wish, is in many ways something that could have happened without the patient coming to the practice. OK, so what are the implications of that? The first one is, in the spirit of lean operations, we try to make things more efficient. And so if you think about an expensive resource, such as a doctor, such as a teacher, you always have to ask yourself, so what I pay for, how much of that is actually real value at time? Right? And so you start to the very left with the total pay time. You know, then you, know, you look at what percentage of the time the doctors are actually in the practice. You take out the times that the doctors weren't booked for appointments because they didn't have a fully booked schedule that day. You take out cancellations, and then that gives you ultimately the time that the doctors were actually seeing patients. Then you subtract the piece where you are acknowledging the 20% we just talked about, that the doctors were doing work that really didn't require that level of training and could have been done by somebody else. So that gives you, in many ways, the true doctor value at time. And then you subtract the 80% that we talked about that really didn't require the doctor to do it in person with you. And then you get the value at time of care that really had to happen in the hospital by the doctor. And it is shocking to see that number. The other thing I wanted to uh, close with is one of the lessons I've learned working in primary care now over the last couple of years is primary care has a fascinating initiative in most healthcare systems called the patient-centered medical home. Now, the most important thing that you need to know about the patient-centered medical home, it's all about the doctor, right? I mean, so, <laughs> so the, the, the patient-centered is uh, that's a nice word to kind of keep the patients uh, happy. But what I wanted to do as part of this analysis, I wanted to walk in the, in the shoes of the patients trying to understand how much are you actually getting out of this time that you're spending on that healthcare encounter in terms of value add, right? Previously, we have looked at the doctor and asked like Dr. So-and-so how what percentage of your time is value add. Now let's look at the patient, right? And so if you put yourselves into the perspective of these veterans, they have to drive to the Philadelphia hospital, they have to look for a parking spot, they have to check in, they sit in the waiting room, they have their vital signs taken, they wait again, and then suddenly they, they, they get these 20 to 30 minutes of care, and then they have to go through checkout, they have to find their car. Uh, oftentimes it involves having uh, a loved one driving them because they are not in a state that they can drive themselves. And you're talking for 20 minutes of care, you're talking about three to four hours of your life. Right? And so I think that's where another real opportunity is, is especially if you now keep in mind that 80% of the care could be done without bringing that patient to the practice, we can start rethinking delivery models for primary care and rely much more on things such as connected health and telemedicine, which I think are the most exciting topics to work on in these, uh, these days. Thank you very much.